are still a few places left that you can't get to from here. Places without phones or faxes or even roads. There are still a few corners of the globe so remote they remain aloof from what we call the modern world. This is the realm of the bush pilot. This is KYW-TV, Philadelphia. Tom Clater is leaving behind his family and friends for a two-year adventure around the world. The 28-year-old Radnor resident checks out his single-engine plane for the last time before taking a solo flight from Wings Airport in Norristown. The purpose is to tr try and go to seven continents in different parts of the world and to live and work with bush pilots. As a bush pilot, Clayton will fly daredevil routes while delivering vital supplies to remote areas. So before taking to the skies, Clayton got his hugs and kisses while cameras recorded all the action. And there was even a special goodbye. Then as the crowd looked on, the pilot closed the cockpit door and took off. The day he left, he made the local TV news. If he makes it back, he'll make history. Tom Clater hopes to be the first pilot to fly around the world, stopping on all seven continents before returning home. This tremendous desire inside to look at other places, to look in places like Greenland and the Sahara Desert, things that I'd only seen on a map in, in high school. And so I think it's a desire to look at different parts of the world and live with people in other parts of the world. But maybe also it's a, a little challenge or test for myself as well. Clater is 31 years old. When he was 12, he set foot in an airplane for the first time. It was to be the start of an obsession. When he was just 18, he earned a pilot's license. By his early 20s, he had begun working as a bush pilot in Africa. Today, Clater owns his own airplane, named Timmy Sartok, after one of Lindbergh's planes. Outfitted with a special reserve tank, the Cessna 180 tail dragger can fly about 14 hours without refueling. The struggle to keep his gas tank full has shaped Clater's journey from the very start. I left home with $20,000. And when I got to Greenland, it cost me $1,000 to fill up my gas tank once. So it <laughs> became very obvious that I was gonna have to find ways of getting money. And my idea, which was only an idea when I left, was that I'd work the plane on the way. And when I got to Niger, I found a job doing a survey of a park, which paid me $8,000. And so I've been able to find jobs for the plane on the way. Besides working the plane as he goes, Clater's writing a book about his experiences in the far corners of the world. So far, he's logged 46,000 miles, three continents, and 28 countries.
On December 2, 1990, he left Pennsylvania, heading north through Canada, to Greenland and then Iceland. In the summer of 91, he arrived in Europe. And early in 92, he began traveling through Africa. The longest leg of Clater's journey so far has been on the African continent. His video journal is testimony to a rare and spontaneous adventure. We're now in Dan Tokpa Market, which is the largest market in West Africa. As we've seen in most of West Africa, there's a very large market in fetishes. Crocodile heads, bats, birds. La tête de vautour. Oui. Et ici, c'est la vipère. C'est la vipère. La vipère ici. Oui. Et là, c'est le piton. C'est le piton. Oui, c'est la tête de piton. Uh -huh. Tout -ce cela. Qu'est-ce que tu fais avec ces choses Ah, oh, ça là, on travaille beaucoup. On ne peut pas citer ça aujourd'hui. <rire> Qu'est-ce qu'il doit dire Qu'est-ce qu'il doit dire C'est le bat, hein Nous sommes maintenant dans Lomé et Togo. Qu'est-ce qu'il doit Quel est ton nom Duty. Monsieur Duty. Et Monsieur Duty a avec lui des scorpions. Qu'est-ce que tu fais avec ça On est des élèves. Oui. Ok. Et maintenant, il va me montrer comment il peut utiliser son gris-gris pour que les scorpions ne te bite pas. Ok, allons. Non, là. We just did this once before. I hope it's successful again. Okay. Hello. D'accord. On joue avec le feu là. Wait, just. D'accord. Another. Hey, me. Then it is a fit, huh? Huh? Now in Southwest Africa, Clater has spent the last few weeks exploring the country of Namibia. Today he plans to visit an area rich in African history, a group of abandoned towns near the Namibian coast. There's a town southwest of the Namib Desert called Komenskop. And this town was founded because a railway worker working on the rail line found a very pretty stone. And this led to a diamond rush, which caused this town to spring out of the desert. And then as quickly as it started, it disappeared. Kolmanskop was followed by other boom towns, a sudden cluster of diamond settlements that sprang up in the lifeless desert. At the turn of the century, diamonds were so plentiful here, they say you could collect a jar full a night by just picking up whatever glistened in the moonlight. In the saloons, you could buy your whiskey and your women with raw diamonds. May 10th, it's a ghost town, almost like the American West. Casinos, hotels, houses, there is something haunting and magical about this place. I keep looking in the sand, half expecting to find a diamond, but there are none.
When the sand was picked clean, the people disappeared. What they left behind is an eerie memento, an empty museum, a movie set. I can almost imagine the sounds of music and laughter here. Plater's itinerary is deliberately unpredictable. If he has enough money for gas, he can simply scout around off the beaten path for material for his book. What I'm trying to do is visit remote parts of the world, places like this desert, jungles, ice caps, and places which are basically the frontiers of civilization. And the venue by which I do that is I look for bush pilots because bush pilots work in these areas. And very often they're not just pilots, but they're scientists, they're businessmen, they're research, they're missionaries, and conservationists. These pilots also teach me the particulars of these various areas and how to go through them safely. Recently, another bush pilot told Clater about an isolated shipwreck on the Namibian beach one of the many skeletons along Africa's infamous skeleton coast. Plater is looking for a South African freighter called the Otavi, which sank in 1945. A mere footnote in history, the wreck is said to be extremely well preserved thanks to the tiny cove where it went aground. Just beyond this swept area in that beach is a rock peninsula and one beyond it. You'll see in between the two is the shipwreck. Right here, the ocean is just moving back off the Otavi. There's seals just piled up around that wreck. But you can see the wreck jutting up out of the sand and part of it's been split off. And those are seals, they're just packed all around it. May 15th, I'm on the edge of one of the oldest deserts in the world, the Skeleton Coast, where countless shipwrecked sailors lost their lives. It feels like a place I was never meant to be. Like a ghost, the Otavi looms before me, rising three decks above the sand, something almost lost and forgotten. I try to imagine the men who wrecked here half a century ago. How did it feel to be marooned in such a place? The wreck of the Otavi is so inaccessible that Clater is probably the lonely vessel's first visitor in decades. His book promises to be a guided tour of the middle of nowhere. May 16th. Today is the 894th day since I left home. Sometimes I worry that I will become too comfortable being alone. Already I can't imagine what it would be like to be in a room full of people. 
I miss the most unbelievably trivial things. A bookstore, a movie, a long hot shower, a pillow. The only sound I hear is a hyena in the distance. I wonder where it is. But I relish the quiet, the solitude. May 17th, I wake up at dawn and it's freezing. I'm always amazed at how cold it can be in the desert. I brush my teeth and break down camp. And then, almost as though it were a part of myself, I see to the plane. I almost never talk about the danger of what I'm doing. But of course I think about it. I check everything, then I check it again. Three pilots I met in the Faroe Islands were recently killed when their helicopter crashed. That makes 15 pilots, 15 friends, who have died since I started flying. There's so much of flying that's completely out of your control, so I try to concentrate on what I can control. Despite the dangers, and perhaps also because of them, Claytor loves to fly. upside down and yet everything inside the airplane stays the same. It's kind of fun. If you do it wrong, you can really get into a lot of trouble. You can really, really scare yourself. If you do it too fast or too slow or you stall the tail, your heart drops. So that's when I do it by myself to practice it. Because you don't want to do it wrong when you're trying to show it to someone. But the life of a bush pilot is not all barrel rolls and stunt flying. With funds running low, Claytor needs to start looking for his next paying job. He decides to leave Namibia, flying northeast to Botswana. Here he'll visit an old friend and fellow bush pilot. Perhaps with a little luck, he'll also get a line on some work. Bush pilots everywhere seem to have an informal network for news and information. In Africa, many are involved in wildlife management and conservation, like Lloyd Wilmot. Just keep a lookout for breeding birds and any sign of vultures and, and hyenas. Wilmot runs a safari camp in Chobe National Park. In addition, he uses his plane to help combat poaching a, in the immense man. refuge, uh, where he is an honorary game warden. These herds come and go. Some have already pushed off north. Today, Claytor has come along with Wilmot to track a herd of elephants just outside the park. You got a huge herd underneath you right now. Roger. I'm turning to the right. I want to have another look at that herd. OK, I'm coming up behind you.
Now that they've spotted the elephants from the air, they'll continue the search on foot tomorrow. Lloyd Wilmot is one of the few wildlife experts who routinely approaches elephants without the protection of a vehicle. He and Clater will wait at a watering hole for a close-up view of the animals. What do you do when you, if, you're, if you're walking through and you're surprised by an elephant? Is there a, a trick uh, to not getting eaten? There's no real trick. The thing is to try and keep the wind in your favor. If you, if you can... Uh, see him before he sees you, you can figure out which way the wind's blowing, and then uh, go downwind of him and keep clear of him. But in the ultimate analysis, if you are confronted, you get uh, to something like a big tree like that. If you can't climb it, you just get behind it. And uh, you have a clod of earth like that lump over there or a piece of wood, and uh, throwing that at them often turns them and distracts them. Mm. In their sort of uh, terms of reference, nothing has ever thrown anything at them. <laughs> so they get a bit disconcerted when you actually throw something at them. Later approaches a bull to shoot some video of him. But the large male has no interest in posing for the camera. May 22nd, I've just been charged by a wild elephant. Lloyd laughs lightly like he's seen it a thousand times. Neither one of us says very much. There's really not much to say after an elephant charge. After a while, a large group emerges from the bush. It's an extraordinary thing to be so close to these magnificent creatures. It's easy to feel small in the face of such splendid power. Thanks to the bush pilot grapevine, Clater has secured a job in a national park in Zimbabwe.
The two pilots part company in the Botswana sky. Slater's headed for Hwangi National Park in western Zimbabwe. But first, he'll make a slight detour to one of Africa's most spectacular natural wonders, Victoria Falls. Okie doke, well, we'll check that on the ground. Uh, November Charlie, and how's the falls flowing, over? I think they're still flying as they were before. They're flying downhill today. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, we should check the FIR in about three minutes and ETA yours at 1509, over. I'm now flying low over the Zambezi River, approaching Victoria Falls. And as you look ahead, at the trees, you just see this mist, this towering mist, rising out of the trees and above the water. And the Africans call it Mosi Otunio, which means the smoke that thunders. The Zambezi River drops up to a million gallons of water a second over the 350-foot falls. Even before it comes into sight, the roar of the plummeting water is deafening. The rainbow everywhere. You can see the mist filling the screen. There's a rainbow coming across it. Wow. Look at that. Right below the falls, you can see their gorges that just zig back and forth about five times. And in these gorges, it also drops down to this boiling black water below. It's, it's spectacular. May 26th. I can't resist flying down into the gorge, even though it's risky. Not only could I be killed, I could probably get arrested. As I corner, the water explodes into a torrent of frothing white waves. Sometimes flying is just a fast way to travel, and sometimes, it's the greatest thing in the world.
Leaving the falls behind, Claytor reaches Huangi National Park. Before he can land in a remote area, Claytor has to clear the runway. Collisions with animals are one of the greatest dangers bush pilots face in Africa. Feeling strong this morning. Okay. On the ground, Claytor gets some help refueling and prepares for his next assignment in the air. Okay. Is that enough slack? Conservationist and researcher Janet Racklow has hired Claytor to help track an injured rhinoceros in the park. Racklow is part of a controversial program designed to protect severely endangered rhinos. Park officials in Zimbabwe have been removing the horns from dozens of rhinos in a desperate attempt to deter poachers. Claytor was there during one of the dehorning operations and videotaped it. First time I saw rhinos getting their horns cut off was in the southeast section of Zimbabwe. This huge rhino was lying there, sedated, and this man pulled the starter on a chainsaw, and this chainsaw started ripping the horn off his face. You start to ask yourself, why are we doing this? And what was made clear to me was that there's nothing else they can do here. Rhino Claytor and Racklow are searching for is an adult female named Zola. Even though she was dehorned, she was shot and badly wounded by poachers. In the vast 5,000 square mile park, the only way to locate individual animals is from the air. Even then, it's no easy matter. We're starting to get a signal? Okay. Once we get a little bit closer, we can li listen on both wings. We have right. an antenna on each wing, and we want to balance the, the volume that comes in on the two wings, and okay. that'll keep us going right towards it. Okay. Geez, it's hard to see through this brush, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay, straight. Well, she's on your left wing. Real close. Nothing here. Nothing Real close, here. directly under. Nothing under. On the left. It's quite possible her, her collar has come off. I mean, it's come off several of the other animals. And so what we'll need to do is just come in on foot and find the collar or find the animal. But you know, now we know the area. With the help of expert trackers, the search for Zola continues on foot. Dr. Michael Koch is the veterinarian for Zimbabwe's national parks. Once they find the rhino, Dr. Koch will shoot her with a tranquilizer dart so he can treat her gunshot wounds. I need uh... <clears throat> mm. oh, the whole leg swollen here, man. 
but that's, consider... that's from a gunshot there? Yeah. yeah. What we need is an, I need an eye cover. Where's my... On a shirt? But it looks good, the horn. Yeah, yeah it looks nice, good. It? I mean, you can see she's done some wearing here around the edge. If Zola had died, the poachers would probably have cut off what was left of her horn to sell. It's probably... Still, oh, dehorning here? does appear to reduce so poaching it, overall. It's easy to, to want to take an emotional stance to conserving these animals. And, and if you take that stance, dehorning is, a, is hard to justify. But I think we have to be realistic and we have to look at what's happening. And I mean, I'd be really sad to, to have to tell my children or my grandchildren that, you know, sorry, there used to be something as magnificent as a dinosaur, but, but we killed them all. Come on, come on, guys. Come on. OK, one more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what we've got is a massive cellulitis here. Her shoulder's not too swollen. It was, it was right in but here, I think she's right? probably got an osteomyelitis with her bone in there. Strafed with machine gun fire, the huge creature's legs yeah, are know, swollen with infection. Once her wounds are treated, Zola will be given an antidote to the tranquilizer and freed. May 27th, the immense animal awakes and rises to her feet, but does not move. Then slowly she lowers her massive head to the ground and uses her chin as a crutch to limp off into the bush. The doctor sounds optimistic, but I am not. She might survive these wounds, but to a poacher, her life is worth far less than the sad stump at the end of her nose. Four days later, Claytor receives a wire from Janet Racklow. Despite all their efforts, Zola has died. Back on his way, Claytor returns to the explorer's life. He has decided to pay a visit to an orphanage for chimpanzees in Burundi. Claytor heads north towards Burundi. But first, he'll cross Zambia and an area called the Kafui Flats. I'm now somewhere over the Kafui swamps, and as far as you can see in every direction, it's absolutely flat, and it's this green patina over dark blue water. If you didn't see the sun reflecting in the water, you'd think that it was grass. But by the sun's reflection, you know that it's just a, a green patina of growth on top of this vast swamp. I think if you lost your engine here, uh, I'm not sure how deep it is, but you'd probably just mush into this green gut and just sit on top of the wing and then try to call someone. <laughs> you just can't crash here. If he did crash here, Claytor's tiny plane would be almost impossible to spot from the air. The orange stripes on the tail and wings are a safety measure. If he goes down, the bright color might make it easier to find him in the empty terrain he frequents. Claytor hopes he'll never have to find out if it works. And crashing isn't the only thing a pilot has to worry about. I've had a couple of close calls. When I got to Algeria, it was right after the military took over, and they thought that a Bush pilot was a pilot for George Bush. And right after the Gulf War, George Bush was not a very popular person. So I tried to quickly explain that a Bush pilot had nothing at all to do with George Bush. Claytor decides to make a brief stop in Zambia to refuel and chart his course to Burundi. Mm. 
Bonji. 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 How is everything here? No, everything is okay. I am from Indola, but I have need to refuel. Hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. I'm Tom. Hello, how are you? I'm Nice to meet you. Hello. How are you? Yeah, fine. Hello, how are you? Where are you guys from? No, we are just from around here. The lanky American is an unusual sight wherever he lands and his grasp of African languages is often a crowd pleaser. Where did you learn Nyanja? Nyanja, in, in Malawi. Oh, I, see. Okay. I know Muli Bwanji, <laughs> I know Ndili Buino, <laughs> Zikomo Kwambili, <laughs> Mbambo. This is my first time ever to come here. Nice so, to meet you. <laughs> ah, it's very nice to meet you. And only this landing, I'm supposed yes. to pay something, landing fee. Ah, I can pay it. How much should I pay you? I want to pay if, how much? It's supposed to be five, six. This is the... How many kilograms? Ah, uh, it's one ton. One ton. Five sixty. Five sixty. How many U.S. dollars is that? It's about one U.S. dollar. Less than that. Okay. Can I pay you two U.S. dollars? That will be okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So is that okay? This is more than okay. Okay. <laughs> See, that's the problem is. No, but please, the change is for you guys. If you can have it. Okay. So All thank right. You, thank you. Because landing fees are here are very reasonable. Yeah, very cheap. Yes. <laughs> Just ten a cent, maybe. <laughs> so, how many how many quach is it to one dollar? It's about uh, five hundred. Oh, and the landing fee is five quach. Five quach. So it's one one hundredth of a dollar. That's right. So it's one cent. <laughs> Around that much. <laughs> okay. Well, then but these these are for okay. you to do as you wish to improve your airport. Okay, so. okay. I think that's the cheapest airport I've ever landed at in my whole that's life. That's time factor. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you later. Zukomo <laughs> kwambili. When you fly in the day, it's very bumpy because the sun heats the surface of the African Earth and it just jets these currents of air straight up. At night, it's completely different. The air is calm and still. You can see the stars, you can see fires in the ground. You can see the moonlight reflecting off of lakes. And it's a very calm and peaceful and kind of reflective time. You're suspended in space above this large black thing that you can't see. And it's, it's, it's mysterious. Sir, Roger to report uh, maintaining 7-5. Okay, Raj, Charlie check 7-5 this time, over. Report our area out. Roger, we'll call area out, November Charlie. The Chimpanzee Orphanage in northern Burundi was founded by the Jane Goodall Institute in 1989. Chimps confiscated from smugglers are brought here to be cared for by conservationists and volunteers. Dean Anderson is the director of the refuge. At the moment, it is home to 17 chimpanzees and one baby gorilla. How old is she? She's about three. How did you find her? I mean, well, she was confiscated at the airport. Mm. She was taken from the from her forest home, as all the other chimps were. In Zaire. In Zaire, in the Cayuse Biega area, eastern Zaire, because she's an eastern lowland gorilla, uh, by poachers. And then she was brought to Kigali. Uh, she was in transport from Zaire through Kigali, Rwanda, to Egypt. Now, Egypt. Egypt. Now, what they were going to do with her there, I don't know. Probably a zoo or, or Is that something. where they were mostly going to zoos at one point? Or is this... Zoos, probably. A gorilla would probably go to a zoo. Because a private person would just... No. Not be so interested, right? Because no. they get too big and too violent. Yes. Then well, she... too big. I mean, how, yeah. how do you keep a 300-pound gorilla or something? I mean...
June 4th. There are baby chimpanzees everywhere. They are affectionate and smart. Each one has a distinct personality. One has mastered the art of threading a shoelace. If they were returned to the forest, they would be killed by wild chimps. They can never go home. My mind drifts back to a day I spent in Equatorial Guinea and that little chimp I found. We just had something to eat at a restaurant and I came out and sitting here tied to this chair is this little baby chimpanzee. I don't know how old it is. And he seems very cold. He was hugging himself when I found him. And it's, I'm shocked by it. I don't know what to think. He's just sitting here. Most of the chimps in the orphanage were captured by poachers to be sold as pets. Though they are extremely appealing as babies, growing chimpanzees are too smart and too destructive to make good pets. Once the chimps become powerful adults, they must be confined in cages a lonely place for these social primates who quickly become bored and desperate for attention. So what should I do? Oh, I can say hi to Socrat. Hi, Socrat. Soon, Dean hopes, now, the orphanage may be able to give some chimps a little more freedom. This is a temporary situation. We're hoping to get money together to put them into the sanctuary that we're talking about. And uh, there they'll be They'll all be together, they won't have cages, they won't have ropes. Uh, they'll be in an open space where they can have a semi-natural social life, which is so important for chimpanzees. Wildlife in Africa seems to be in direct conflict with, with people here because they need space and the animals need space and the animals end up losing. I was, I was impressed that someone was trying to take these chimps that had already basically lost so much. They were trying to, in a way, give them back to themselves in nature. Maybe it, it, it's not perfect, but it was something. <laughs> Soon, Clater must leave Africa and make the rest of his way around the globe. But first, he wants to make one more stop. For some time, he has wanted to visit Zaire. But so far, he hasn't been granted clearance to land there. OK, this is Mike Oscar, uh, Southern Zaire, over. Roger, Mike, Mike Oscar, November Charlie. Is there any way for me to confirm a clearance from Indola? Over. It's very difficult uh, because of the fact that uh, there's no uh, telephone communication between the two places. Over. Okay, Roger. If I arrive with my copy of the AFTN request, uh, how easy is it to negotiate once on the ground? Over. How much money do you have? Over. <laughs> I've got a fair amount. How much do you think it would cost, over? At least $250 each, over. Roger, understand. The turbulent political situation in Zaire makes it extremely difficult to get permission to enter the country. Clater decides to go in anyway, without an official clearance. He'll touch down at a small airstrip where he can refuel from his own supply. If he's lucky, no one will ask him for his papers. Go, 
Jumbo. Jumbo, sir. Hello. Yes, Where well, it can be a mingi sana, huh? In Africa, there's a rule, an unwritten rule, and that is that it's it's easier to get pardoned than it is to get permission. Because of communications and how difficult it is to get clearances and things, it's sometimes easier just to do them. And afterwards, of course, you get in trouble. But the Africans are very forgiving, good people, and very often they'll forgive you. For Clater, every day is part of a grand, if solitary, adventure. He's been away from home for nearly three years, and it could be three more before he returns. From Africa, he will head east to the four remaining continents between him and home. Clater has grown accustomed to being a stranger everywhere he goes. But he is also changed by every place he visits and every person he meets. I think there's a part of me that's become a little bit African because the Africans have a saying which is when you ask them when they'll come back or what time something will be ready, they'll smile and look at you and say any time from now. So when people ask me when I'm going to get home, sometimes I just can only say any time from now.